Hello everyone, it's 11 o'clock, so we will get started. Welcome to our Yellow River Forest Virtual Fall Forestry Field Day. My name is Julia Baker. I'm a program specialist with the Natural Resources Extension Team at Iowa State University, and I will be hosting this event for everyone. Today, we will have a series of three videos followed by three live presentations. There will be options to ask questions in between the videos, and we'll have a longer question and answer session again at the end of the program. We ask today that you keep your camera and microphone muted. That means that you will be able to see and hear us, but we won't be able to see or hear you. Also, don't be surprised if you become muted, if you accidentally come off mute. Uh, that just helps everything run smoothly and prevents interruptions. So, in order to ask questions, we, have, we will be using the chat feature. Uh, that chat button you can see at the bottom of your screen. If you click on that, uh, a dialogue window will open and you'll be able to type your question in, press enter, and that will come to me. And I will read the questions off to our speakers. Um, Billy has also sent a message through the chat uh, to help you locate that feature. And with that, I want to thank everyone for being here today, and I will hand things off to Billy. All right. Well, thank you, Julia, and thank you all for attending. Um, again, my name is Billy Beck. I'm the Extension Forestry Specialist with Iowa State University Extension and Outreach. I'm very happy that you're spending a part of your day with us today, and really big thanks to Julia, our host, and our speakers today for making this possible. Um, this is generally one of the largest in-person events forestry-wise in the state, so we're really happy we can keep it going this year in spite of everything uh, in this virtual format, so we're, we're pretty excited about that. Like Julia said, we're visiting three sites, a shelterwood harvest, a tree planting site, and a storm damage site, and we're going to follow that up with uh, a timber market update, uh, an overview of the Iowa Tree Farm Program, and then uh, finally an update on the Rusty Patch Bumblebee. Um, so with that, again, Julia said we're going to have interspersed Q&A where you can uh, interact with the speakers live uh, between the videos. But if you don't have time to get your, uh, your questions in, we're going to have a lot of time at the end for live Q&A. Or also uh, keep your eyes open for an email from us uh, with a resource sheet with all kinds of information relevant to the uh, topics you see uh, presented here so today. So the three sites we're going to visit, um, they all kind of tie around this theme of resiliency. 2020 has been a year of resiliency. Uh, and the forests are, in Iowa are no different. Uh, just all the annual stressors they deal with in addition to the drought, the derecho. So um, the topics today are really tied together uh, with about resiliency. And we're, we're gonna hear about a uh, really exciting new collaborative project that's gonna impact Yellow River greatly. So with that, um, I'm gonna hand it off to the person at the center of it all, uh, Area Forester Bruce Blair with the Iowa DNR. Bruce? Uh, hopefully everyone can hear me. Um, yeah, so I'm the area forester at Yellow River State Forest, uh, which is in the far northeast corner of the state of Iowa. It's near Harper's Ferry. <clears throat> and we're in the beautiful landform region we call the Driftless Area, which has escaped glaciation over the years. So we're a much more hilly um, area with lots of forest cover compared to most of Iowa. Um, Yellow River State Forest got its start back in the mid 1930s when they started purchasing our, the first properties for this forest. Today we cover about 9,000 acres and um, the entire forest is, uh, is basically designated as a state wildlife management area. So Obviously, a lot of the popular activities done around here include hunting for squirrel, deer, turkey. We got about 11 miles of trout streams, and they're stocked regularly by the Big Spring Trout Hatchery in Alcator. We've got four primitive campgrounds. Two of them are designated for equestrian users, and we got about 40 miles of hiking, biking, and equestrian trails. Um, let's see here. Um, the entire property is managed under a comprehensive natural resource management plan, which is um, period periodically reviewed and updated from time to time. Um, we work collaboratively with 
other experts in different fields. So if I need, so the plan includes management for prairies, wetlands, streams, for birds, for the forest. So I, I, I'm very um, lucky to have some really great experts that work around me that can help me with managing those areas as well. One of the important uh, management objectives here at Yellow River is scientific research. Um, and right now we are working collaboratively with Iowa State University on a new project where, where we were, they, they were awarded a grant. And the title of the research project is called Restoring Adaptive Capacity in Driftless Area Forests. And I'm really excited to work with Miranda Curzon from Iowa State University, who is the lead researcher on that. And, we're, and she's going to talk about that project in the video that we're about to show you. Um, one of the main objectives that we're trying to demonstrate here at Yellow River is the production, the sustainable production of uh, timber products. And uh, oak trees are one of the, our main uh, products that we're trying to target. And uh, but the, one of the problems is we're losing the oak resource here pretty quickly. And the main reason for that is the, what we call forest succession, where trees that are more tolerant of shade, like maple and basswood and ash, tend to eventually over time take over our forests. So we have to do a lot of very active management on our landscape if we want to maintain that oak resource. And shelter wood is one of those management techniques that we're using. And again, we're going to demonstrate that a little bit here on the video. And with that, I guess it's back to you, Julia. Thank you, Bruce. As Bruce mentioned, we will now see a video that features a modified shelter wood. My name is Miranda Curzon. I'm an assistant professor in forestry at Iowa State University. And I'm here at Yellow River State Forest, a beautiful specimen of forest that we have here in Iowa, to talk about a new project that I'm working on with Bruce Blair, area forester, who you'll get to hear from in just a moment. And this new project is focused on developing and testing adaptive silviculture for climate change. Um, we've got concerns about future climate conditions and other potential threats and stressors that are associated with that. And we're wanting to think into the future with our management to prepare our forests for that. So this study will be part of a much larger network that's been in place for about 10 years now. There are other studies that are in development um, at the same time as ours. So it's a pretty innovative approach to research that is intended to be operational scale and to address the need that managers have for examples of what to do uh, with their forest to integrate concerns about climate change into their management so that they're also achieving all of the traditional goals um, that they, they normally try to achieve. So uh, this project starts with a partnership like what Bruce and I are developing. Uh, this, we're actually working with other partners in Minnesota and Wisconsin too, so it's a really broad scale regional approach we're going to identify vulnerabilities to these forests that we wanna be thinking intentionally about with our management. So the first step in this, this larger long-term study that we're starting is to have a workshop that involves about 100 stakeholders who will be coming from three different states involved in the larger project. So from Minnesota, Wisconsin, and from Iowa. And we'll be learning together about the latest climate science, how that might impact our forests, so that we can think creatively about three different strategies that can be used to prepare these forests to adapt to future climate. So that includes resistance, resilience, and transition. With the resistance treatment, we're wanting to maintain you know, the, the condition that is presently here. 
uh, in spite of potential threats or stressors that we might anticipate in the future. With resilience, we're wanting to build in the capacity for these systems to experience stress or disturbance and then bounce back, maintaining or resuming, coming back to that original structure and function and composition. And then with transition, we're thinking a little bit, we're, we're pushing the envelope maybe a little bit more and actually trying to put that forest into a, a, a good place to transition to future conditions. So a hallmark of this study is actually developing silvicultural treatments together as a group. And I don't know what those treatments will be yet, but I suspect there's a good chance that we will use shelter wood. Um, shelter wood is a, a traditional silvicultural regeneration method, but it's one that is highly adaptable. You can tailor that to whatever forest ecosystem you're working in. And, and Bruce is going to talk more about the, the Shelterwood method and how he's adapting that here at Yellow River. Hello, uh, my name is Bruce Blair and I'm the area forester and I work at Yellow River State Forest. And we're standing here uh, in a beautiful stand of oak trees uh, in a Shelterwood um, uh, stand where we're trying to regenerate oak. Um, as a forester over the years, I get asked by a lot of people why oak is so important and why we talk about it so much. And the reason is uh, oak, oak forests are a wonderful habitat for wildlife and they also produce uh, really good uh, high quality timber for, for a lot of forest products. So it's a really important uh, type of forest cover that we want to try to perpetuate into the future. Um, but the problem with perpetuating oak is that it takes a lot of management efforts in order to, 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 to sustain it. Back in the old days before uh, uh, European settlers came to this area, the Native Americans were actively managing and tending these forests using fire as a management tool. When European settlers came, we kind of stopped uh, using fire as a management tool. And what happened was over time, uh, shade tolerant species like uh, maple, basswood, and ash have slowly crept into our forests. So we've got, uh, we want to set back that process by using a tool called shelterwood. It's a, it involves a lot of disturbances, but those disturbances are really important in order to regenerate oak because it is a very disturbance tolerant or disturbance dependent species. There's a number of ways that you can, techniques that you can use to regenerate oak, uh, but Shelterwood is a technique that what we feel it mimics the natural forces that would re have regenerated oak in the first place. You know, some other techniques you could use would be like clear cutting with planting. You could uh, have a clear cut scarify the site during a good mast year and get regeneration that way. And we've had really good success here at Yellow River using that type of technique. So we tried, but in this case with shelterwood, what we're trying to do is mimic what nature would have done hundreds of years ago. And those forces would have been fire. So what the fires do is they can help control the shade tolerant understory that has been crept creeping in here for hundreds of years since we stopped burning the landscape. And so fire is an important tool to modify the whole system so that uh, oak will have a competitive advantage here once again. So one of the uh, differences between shelterwood system and other uh, artificial regeneration systems is that we're depending on uh, the natural regeneration through seed and sometimes it can take a number of years to build up uh, enough uh, oak regeneration where you can do the overstory removal harvest. And here at Yellow River State Forest, we have the advantage that we can be very patient. Uh, we may have to wait 20 years or more before this is sufficiently regenerated where we could do any additional harvesting. If we tried to harvest before that happened, then we really wouldn't have gained uh, enough to where we got the regeneration that we're after. All right, now we have time for questions for Bruce and Miranda. Please type those into the chat box and I will read them off for our speakers. Our first question is for Miranda. 
Um, what tree species or forest types are most vulnerable to climate change and why? That's a good question. Um, and I, I may not have a satisfying answer for it. <laughs> There's a lot of research that's ongoing that's trying to figure that out. Each of our different, each of our forest systems have different vulnerabilities. Um, I think um, something that Bruce and I have talked about a little bit is managing bottomland forests, especially in the northeastern part of the state. I have a lot of issues um, that are impacting those forests from invasive species to increased frequency and severity of flooding. Um, so obviously we've lost ash out of those systems. We don't have the same elm component that we used to, um, and we're concerned about other things that may impact <coughs> species too. So that's a concern, um, but I mean, we're, we're also thinking ahead to other pests that may move into our region and impact some of the hardwood species that haven't had issues before. Um, and there's, yeah, there's a lot of work looking at climate too to try to figure out exactly what it is that we need to prepare for. Okay, thanks Miranda. Uh, Bruce, we also have a question for you. Uh, is the shelter wood practice something that a landowner could do on a small acreage, like less than 10 acres? Um, and if it can't, is it possible, what would people be able to do on a smaller property at home? Yeah, I think you could, you got me, okay. I think you could uh, practice shelter wood on just about any scale that you want. You could go as small as you want. You could do it an acre or two acres. Um, that that's not what's important. I think for a private landowner, the main thing is the, the, the is to be very patient because uh, if you're relying on natural regeneration, it may take quite a while. Um, oak are notorious see, uh, as as far as being fickle at seeding. Um, there we we call them uh, uh, synchronized seeders or gregarious seeding. So they may not have a big bumper crop of seed for any, maybe even as long as five years. And usually you get your best regeneration during those bumper crop years. So uh, you have to be very patient with this system. One of the modifications you can use with the shelterwood method is you could do underplanting with seedlings to kind of speed up and control the regeneration process. Um, in that, in either way, the other thing is for a private landowner, you really need to assess your, the deer pressure that you have to make sure that, you know, the deer aren't too high where they would, uh, you know, eat up all of your regeneration. Um, one, one, if you do have a lot of deer, what you could do in the fall, uh, when the little seedlings are starting to flag and, and show a bright red on their leaves, they're really easy to spot. And in that case, another modification you can make is to put a plastic or metal tree shelter over your seedlings that you get each fall. Um, but yeah, I think you could do a shelter wood on just about any scale you want. Okay, um, that covers almost all of the questions we have so far. Um, if we haven't gotten to your question, there will be more time later, uh, and we can also follow up via email. So next, we will go to our tree planting site and watch a video there. My name is Trent Suchel, forestry specialist with the Iowa DNR, and we're standing here in a 17-acre tree planting that was established in 2017 in an idle crop field. And this tree planting sits in a bottom land, and we're surrounded by forested cover on all sides, and Paint Creek runs right adjacent to the stand. And so in this planting, we planted a variety of, of tree species. We planted four different oak species, shagbark hickory, black cherry, and three separate conifer species. And the objectives of this planting 
were first to defragment Yellow River State Forest. And so we recognize that Yellow River is unique in the sense that it is a large tract of forested land and an otherwise fragmented landscape. And so this tree planting is gonna help aid in any existing fragmentation that we do have here at Yellow River. A secondary objective of this planting is gonna to be to provide wildlife habitat and benefits to wildlife species. And so we planted four separate oak species and that's gonna provide hard mast to those species. We, we incorporated black cherry, which is gonna provide a soft mast. And the three separate conifer species are gonna provide good habitat quality uh, for wildlife in the future. And so this, this planting is also gonna help provide 17 acres of carbon sequestration in the future. And finally, the tree planting itself is looking really well. The red oaks are growing really well. You can see they're over my head. Some of the shagbark hickories are even putting on a little bit of growth. And we generally think of those species as a slow growing species at first. I would attribute the success of this planting to putting tree species on sites that are adequate for their growth. And so we selectively put trees on different parts of this planting so that we, they could grow in the best conditions. And we also put these tree species and we positioned certain species together so that they will grow at the same rates. And finally, another benefit to this planting and why it's been successful is that there's been a lot of maintenance involved. And so that maintenance is really important when you're doing your tree plantings. So from the untrained eye, this tree planting might look really messy to most folks, uh, but really all the weed growth that we have in here underneath our tree seedlings really provide great habitat for wildlife. And those weeds are producing a lot of seeds that a lot of wildlife species are eating and utilizing on the landscape. Now we have time for people to ask questions of Trent. Again, please type those into the chat and I will read them off to Trent. Uh, Trent, our first question is, were those trees in that planting planted by hand? And if not, uh, how did you plant them? So those trees in that planting were planted with a tree planter. And so that's generally what's used in plantings um, in idle crop fields where you don't have a lot of topography. Um, and so that, that tree planter is an implement that you pull behind a tractor and there's a seat on it and an individual, or sometimes there's two seats where two people can sit. Um, and they sit there and there's a knife in the middle that knifes into the ground. And then you can simply grab your bare root seedlings from a bucket of water that you have on your planter. And you, you put that into the ground where that knife brings out a slit of soil, you put that in the ground, and then there's packing wheels behind that pack that soil back in. And so that was the, that was how that planting was planted. Great. Um, Trent, we also have a question about which conifers did you plant? Uh, so the conifers that were planted out there, and Bruce, you can touch on this too, as far as why as you chose those, those species. Um, Eastern red cedar, um, European larch, and the third one was what species, Bruce? Nor Norway spruce. Norway spruce. And so all those all those three species provide great habitat, which is what we wanted. Provides thermal cover for wildlife, um, and they're all doing really well. We had a little bit of trouble with the eastern red cedar at the beginning um, with Phomopsis but uh, they come out of it, which is pretty general. As those trees get older, they uh, become more resilient. All right, um, Trent, was there any mowing that was done on that site or did, they, did you do any mowing right after you planted the trees? Yeah, so there was, there was constant maintenance on that tree planting. Um, there was, uh, there was some site preparation involved with some spraying and then um, some spraying between the rows. And then finally, we're at the point now where we can just use mowing as our site preparation. Um, and that's super important in your tree plantings when you're doing any plantings on private land, anybody that's watching, um, all of that preparation and maintenance is, is crucial in a successful tree planting. 
We will also have a link to a website in the follow-up resource packet uh, that can that'll walk people through this planting. So um, if you want to know more about what Trent said, <laughs> we'll have some follow-up information for you as well. Uh, that is all of the questions that are here now. Thank you, Trent. Now we will move on to a severe wind damage site and Billy will um, explain some about that in this next video. Hi, I'm Billy Beck, Extension Forestry Specialist with Iowa State University. We are standing in a white pine stand that was damaged uh, in 2017 by a severe wind event that spawned tornadoes uh, in the area. As you can see, we've got massive damage to the canopy here. These trees are literally snapped in half. We got a ton of debris on the ground, and this has really opened up the canopy, this localized wind event. And you can see the explosion of understory vegetation that this storm has produced with all the new sunlight in there. And this I'm going to tie this back to this massive wind event we had in central Iowa, uh, the, the August 10th derecho. This is kind of a smaller scale of that. And it's almost like a fast forward three years in time. This happened three years ago, and you can see what this would look like, what the derecho impacts might be going three years forward. And that's a, that's a big concern with the changing climate. We're going to see more frequent events. We're going to see events of greater intensity. So this is going to be a concern for, for forest management in the future. A lot of folks are kind of confused right now. They're panicking. You know, you see this, this massive amount of destruction, and they just really don't know where to start about managing their woodlands. And what's the first step to even take? First off is don't panic. Uh, treat this as an opportunity. It depends um, a lot about your forest management plan, your goals, but this could be a great opportunity ahead of us here. I would really work to assess the site as best as you can, um, as safe as you can too. So if you look around, the, the, the things I would keep an eye out for are what trees are damaged, the extent of that damage, how they're damaged. So for example, here they're snapped in half. Uh, are they split? Are they lodged up in other trees? Are they down on the ground? That's going to be a good um, indicator of what you can do moving forward. Uh, I would also highly recommend working with a professional forester. They're, they're going to be your guide through this process. Um, they're going to help you work to create a forest management plan if you don't have one. And that's going to make decisions at this point very easy uh, for you. Another thing to keep an eye out when you're assessing is what is waiting to take advantage of this sunlight. Here in the background, you can see we've got a lot of shade tolerant species and a lot of invasive species that are waiting to take advantage of this new uh, surge of sunlight that's coming down. We've got things like hackberry, bitternut hickory, sugar maple, even some exotic invasive uh, honeysuckle in this patch here too. So uh, assess both the, the damage to the trees, but also what's the next generation waiting. And that's going to be your guide to uh, the steps you can take. So we've touched a lot on climate today, and a big question I get a lot is how can we make our forests more resilient to climate change and the extreme events that we may see increasing in frequency in the future. So the cool thing about that, there's no cookbook guide. Each site is so different. That's the importance of, again, having a plan and working with a forester. Each site is so different, but the great thing is um, it's not that big of a mystery. Um, it's a lot of things that we do in active forest management anyway. It's about assessing the site, monitoring regularly for invasive species to prevent them from taking over the understory before things like this happen and we get a huge burst of sunlight. It's about increasing species diversity. Again, different species are going to react differently to events such as this. Uh, not just species diversity, but stand diversity, stand age diversity. Going around the state looking at the derecho damage, uh, we saw that younger forests were much less impacted than the larger forests that, or the older forests that, that were adjacent to them. So again, increasing that stand diversity as far as age is very important there. So these, in, these events can look absolutely devastating, and they are, but again, it's, it's important not to panic treat this as an opportunity if you've got the regeneration that you want for the next generation of forest this could be a good po starting point so it's almost like it's the beginning not the end really want to encourage you to engage in active forest management that's going to be really the key to climate resiliency
So to close, I highly recommend you visit with your USDA County Service Center. There's a lot of resources out there for storm damage recovery, both financial and technical assistance, and that's going to be uh, one of the things to help you on the road to recovery. Now we have some time for questions for Billy related to that wind damage site. Uh, again, please type those into the chat and I will read them off to Billy. Billy, our first question is, what are some management practices that would increase forest resiliency to these extreme events? Yeah, excellent question. And uh, going around the state and seeing all the different sites, it's almost impossible, like I said, to give this like cookbook guide to what to do following something like this because the damage is different, the existing pre-existing conditions are different, uh, landowners objectives are different. So in a nutshell, I mean, there's a lot of things we're already doing as part of active forest management that are very helpful in resiliency. And I think the number one, not number one, they're all very important, but one of the um, most important you can do is really just to increase diversity. So species diversity, uh, stand diversity, stand age class diversity, structural diversity, just going around and touring these sites from the derecho this uh, summer. Um, for example, landowner in Lynn County lost almost, you know, the entire uh, mature canopy of his, of his forest, but he had interspersed tree plantings and other uh, uh, practices within that canopy. So he was kind of set up already for the next generation of forest. So not, not all was lost. Um, anything you can do to really increase the vigor of the stand. So thinning, uh, forest stand improvement, freeing up resources to the existing desirable trees. Um, those are gonna allow those trees to bounce back more readily. Um, site assessment and monitoring. Uh, this is probably one of the uh, things that folks uh, struggle with just with time, but like, if you have a lot of invasive species and you're not watching the site carefully and not, you know, preemptively striking at those species, if with the wind event comes through, that's going to be the next uh, generation of, of, of um, canopy that's waiting there to take over. So um, really um, thorough site monitoring and assessing um, the issues that you have uh, before things like happen, these happen. And the derecho, is an extreme event, but we're going to see, you know, increasing extreme events. And we see localized wind events every year uh, across the state, not just wind, but ice and, and other damage too. So thorough monitoring. Um, what else? I guess above all, having a management plan and working with a forester is key. Um, when it gets to those kind of situations and you don't have a plan, it's just shocking. You don't know what to do. Um, you don't know what the next step is, but when you have that plan, you've got that vision in your head of where to go, and that's gonna really help with decision-making. So I think above all, the plan is, is, is key, but there's a lot of steps we can do actively uh, when we manage our forests that'll, that'll increase the, the resiliency to these kind of events. Thanks, Billy. Um, you kind of touched on this, so just very briefly, maybe a yes or no. Um, are we actually seeing evidence that this these severe disturbances are going to increase due to climate change? Off the top of my head, yes. I would, I could pull out data for you. Like we, I'm a, a water person. So uh, we are seeing increases in severe uh, flood events, overbank events, um, and just the, uh, the um, sporadic nature of our weather events. So we're getting a lot of rain all at once. Um, and then we're getting longer periods in between those events. And like Miranda mentioned bottomland forest before, you know, they're, they're gonna have a big impact there. You know, we're, flooding is critical for bottomland forest to regenerate, but we're seeing longer durations of flooding into the summer. We're seeing now flooding in the fall. So that's gonna really impact the, for ex just an example, bottomland forest regeneration. So, um, yeah. Okay, we have a lot of good questions still coming in, but I wanna make sure we get through these, um, these presentations. So I will be saving all these and I will get them to every, our speakers here at the end. Um, let's see, our next section of the program will feature three live presentations. Um, Billy mentioned that at the beginning, we'll have a timber market update, 
uh, we will have presenters who will talk about the Iowa Tree Farm Program, and we'll also learn about um, updates on the rusty patched bumblebee. So first we have Pat Grau, who will give us a timber market update. Hello, can you hear me okay? First, first time Zoomer. Uh, well, I'm Patrick Grau from Grau Logs and Lumber out of Elkader, Iowa. Um, I'm just gonna give a quick brief update on markets as, as they sit today. I just wanna make a couple notes. Um, in 2019, global hardwood exports were down 25% and trade to China was down 40%. So I'll kind of segue that into red oaks to start with red oak. Um, the, when we placed the tariffs on the red oak in the summer of 2019, 2018-19, um, the red oak market kind of collapsed. And what happened was a lot of logs that were being, logs and lumber that were being exported into China were now being pushed onto the domestic side. And as a result of that, there was too much domestic production for the the demand that was out there and that and in return drove the red oak price way down and then accompanied with that now moving into the next problem is the COVID-19 pandemic the domestic production really slowed quite a lot um, and now as we go into the fall we're starting to see a little bit of an uptick in the red oak market because of the lack of production on the green side of lumber and that's due to the fact that a lot of sawmills were furloughing employees. Uh, production was just down across the board because of low markets, furloughed employees, et cetera. So now there's a little bit of increase in, in red oak markets right now, but I, I, I'm moving forward with caution on that. I don't know how real they are. Will, time will tell if inventories get filled back up and those, those go back down. Personally, I think we need to get back into a global trade to get the red oak market back up. Um, white oak, the white oak market remains strong. Stave market is really strong. That's the whiskey barrels, wine barrels, uh, beer barrels. Um, although consumption is down, talking because no concerts, no bars, that type of thing, people are, the, the barrel companies are still saying they need a lot of barrels. So that market has stayed strong. And as a result of that, a lot of the better logs are being cut into whiskey barrels and not put into the the uh, aesthetic side, the cabinet side, and, and that has created a more high, a higher demand for better white oak lumber um, in, the, in the domestic side and also exports to Europe. White oak remains appealing to consumers. So my expectations for the white oak market continue to stay strong. Um, I, I hope they stay strong and I, I imagine they will, speaking with different customers. Um, next would be Hard maple, typically throughout the summer months, we don't produce a ton of hard maple. It's a white wood. It tends to stain, crack, check. It's hard to keep around the mills for a long period of time. So now that production is kind of, or inventories have kind of been moved through, we go into September now, October, November, people start producing more hard maple on a little bit better market. There's always a little bit concern, a little bit of a concern that because of a lower red oak market, maple will get overproduced. But um, as of now, maple's okay, but I proceed with a little bit of caution with maple as well. Um, walnut, that's, the, that's always the, the number one in the game. It's regionally specific to Northeast Iowa, this part of the country, region, you know, Wisconsin. Um, we just produce really good walnut, so the demand has stayed really high globally. And even though there's tariffs and trade wars and it just seems to be there's people that or there's ways around things just because the demand remains so high. Um, there is a little bit concern domestically on the low grade white oak or walnut, excuse me, because of the amount of logs that are being sold. The better logs are being exported now domestically. The sawmills are cutting more lower grade logs, producing more low grade lumber. So those inventories are really filling up as a result and it's kind of difficult to move that material. Um, but as far as expectations, I don't see a whole lot of change in walnut moving forward other than um, hopefully staying up. Uh, ash, similar to the situation with red oak, a lot of ash was going into China. Now that production is almost halted, if not halted, the price is really, really poor. Unfortunately, a lot of salvage cutting with ash has to take place, so you can't wait for a better market, otherwise you may lose your material entirely. Um, and then your subspecies basswood, elm, and hickory over time haven't really changed a whole lot from the best price to the worst price based on your management plan. 
you know, those, those are species that are typically not played with the market based on the quality of the tree. Um, and I'll just finish with the, the way we've been able to work through these difficult ups and downs, ebbs and flows of the market is have really good relationship with, relationships with our customers and our clients and just producing a good product through a tough time. And that's, that's allowed us to maintain clients and, um, and keep that line of, of production open. And that's, the, that's what's helped us do it. So I'll, I'll turn it back to you. Thank you, Pat. Now we will have um, some information about the Iowa Tree Program from Jody and Jim Kearns. Hi, I'm uh, Jim Kearns and this is my wife Jody. We're from Edgewood, a uh, small town in Northeast Iowa. And uh, uh, we're gonna tell you a little bit about the tree farm system. We've really, uh, we've been members of the tree farm system for around 35 years now. And uh, really enjoyed, uh, really enjoyed uh, uh, the opportunity to, to net, network with other uh, tree farmers. Uh, it's a great way that we uh, learn and you know see different techniques that work and don't work. Uh, so we've really got a lot of uh, mileage out of the tree farm system. So uh, Jody's going to tell you a little bit about uh, how it all works. Uh, so the tree farm system is a national program uh, funded primarily through industry, but they also accept private donations. There's no uh, fee to be a member of the tree farm system. Uh, we actually joined when um, our forester, when we first bought our tree farm, suggested that we consider joining the tree farm program. Um, when you join, you get the big uh, white and green signs that you frequently see posted at the entrance to tree farms. Um, that is a sign that shows tree that shows your neighbors and friends that you're uh, practicing good sustainable forestry and management in your woods. Um, we uh, on the national level, I guess let's start there. On the national level, what the tree farm program does is they're really our voice for tree farmers and our woodlands. So whenever things are being put on the table at the Capitol, such as uh, the new farm programs or tax laws, things as such, uh, they're there to be a voice to make sure forestry is a part of that conversation. So that's what they do for us on a national level. They also pr provide uh, support and resources to um, individuals or to the state tree farm systems. Each uh, state has a tree farm system in place. In Iowa, we have a committee just like all the other states. Um, our committee is, is compromised of, or composed, excuse me, of um, tree farmers, of foresters, of extension, and of industry. And we get together three to four times a year um, to discuss tree farming in Iowa and forestry in Iowa, what we can do to improve it, support it, make it better. And then one of the privileges we have as a committee each year is to choose the Iowa Tree Farmer of the Year for recognition. Um, that tree farmer is um, chosen from applications that are received from foresters and consultants and other people throughout the state of Iowa. Um, once that tree farmer is selected to be the Iowa Tree Farmer of the Year, uh, we put together a forestry field day on their property to showcase the good work that they're doing. And it goes back to what Jim said, it gives us a um, great opportunity just to get together as tree farmers and learn from each other and find out what is and isn't working. And then of course we get to recognize them at that tree farm with their award and um, things like that. Um, so yeah, tree farm is just a great way to uh, continue to network with your tree farmers in your area. There's also other uh, organizations in this area that you can also um, join that provide um, networking as well. One would be the Iowa Woodland Owners. Another in Northeast Iowa would be um, NIFAC, which is the Northeast Iowa Forestry Advisory Committee. And all those contacts and information on how to join those places are gonna be included in the um, resource page that Julia is putting out for everybody. So, so yeah, join, the, join these great organizations and uh, have fun. Thanks. Thank you. Next, we will hear from Greg Schmidt about the Rusty Patched Bumblebee and I will get those slides shared for you, Greg. All right, thank you very much. My name is Greg Schmidt. I'm a private lands biologist uh, with the Iowa DNR. I'm out of West Union. 
Um, just talking a little bit about a fairly newly uh, listed species, the federally endangered rusty patch bumblebee. Um, as you can see in the picture there, very distinct rusty patch on the back there. That's a male, uh, probably towards the fall. But um, remnant prairies and reconstructed prairies, we've been finding some rusty patch as we look a little harder now for this species that's declined over the years. Um, woodland edges, very important, open woodlands uh, with diverse flowers uh, and shrubs too are very important to this species. Uh, and like the spring ephemerals, especially important. I'll get into that with the next slide if you want to go to that one, uh, Julia. And just talk a little bit about the life cycle of the rusty patch bumblebee and all bumblebees pretty much. Uh, you know, the queen emerges in the spring. Uh, she's looking for those flowers, those shrubs that are blooming early for nectar and it produced uh, pollen. And then she finds and builds a nest, uh, usually like an old chipmunk burrow or just under the ground and then starts laying eggs. So she does the worker bees first. Uh, these are the ones that help build the, the colony up. And then midsummer, late summer, they switch to producing uh, the males and new queens. Uh, that's the uh, reproductive uh, members of the colony there. So they mate in the fall uh, before uh, they die off. So the males, they all, the colony dies off except that uh, uh, pregnant queen. And then she overwinters just below the soil surface uh, for the winter. So uh, I can go to the next slide. Julia. Like I said, the spring ephemerals are pretty important, but all throughout the season too for uh, having diversity of wildflowers and flowering shrubs, flowering trees are very important. Just to show you a little bit where we found some of the rusty patch bumblebee here, it's kind of in northeast Iowa, more east central Iowa, and then into the uh, east of there, in the Wisconsin and in Minnesota mostly, but I uh, do have some known populations. And these outlines here, uh, the center smaller circles are kind of a high uh, priority, high potential zones. So we know we found some bumblebees there, rusty patch bumblebees there. And then the, the uh, primary dispersal zones, a little wider there, or where we think we maybe can uh, enhance habitat and, and probably increase the population. Next slide, please. Just zooming in a little bit uh, further, just to give you an idea kind of where these were found, uh, these, these populations. Like I said, we're finding a few more as we go. The Volga Rec one was a fairly new find last summer, I believe. So uh, doing a little bit more looking on, on land and, and finding these species. So yeah, next slide. Um, Show you just uh, you know Boone. Uh, there is there is a population further west down in Boone and Story County too, but so there might be a lot in between. But we're finding them along rivers. It seems like river corridors are a popular. Uh, the Upper Iowa River there. Uh, you can go next slide. I might have the Cora zoomed in there. So we found them right in the Cora. We had a training on how to identify rusty patch, how to find them, and, and other bumblebees, and um, so we're finding them out there and. You know, the main question is, is it a good thing or a bad thing to have them on your land? You can go to the next slide, Julia. So um, it's actually uh, a good thing. We do have to take some extra precautions maybe if we're in one of those high potential zones, but good woodland management, good forest management, managing for diversity uh, is good uh, bumblebee management too. So not like if you do a burn, not burning all your acres, leaving some refugia. If you do a, a clear cut or the shelter wood, that, that first talk that Miranda gave, you know, the video there and Bruce, they were standing in that, uh, that area of the open, the shelter wood with the, the oaks in it coming up, but there's a lot of wildflowers there too. Very important for, for uh, rusty badge bumblebee and other bumblebees too. But there's opportunities out there for landowners. So really, if you're in one of those zones, our, our Prairie Partners Program, we can help Plant a prairie on a woodland edge or an opening or maybe even in an open woodland or savanna type uh, planting. But also, what I didn't put on the slide was that Fish and Wildlife Service will uh, cost share also in those areas. So you probably have a good chance of getting all your seed paid for uh, for those plantings. But there's other programs out there too. And uh, again, the NRCS, the USDA office, local office is a good place to start uh, or contact me. And we can let you know more about that. I think that was the last slide. So, thanks. 
Thank you, Greg. Uh, we are transitioning into our longer Q&A, and I did get a question come in for you, Greg, so if you just want to take care of that right away. Uh, how large are the rusty patched bumblebee colonies? Uh, that's a good question. <laughs> I think you're talking, you know, uh, maybe uh, only 100, you know, uh, in there as far as uh, uh, you know, throughout the year, it might vary a little bit, of course, but uh, depends a little bit probably on uh, how well that queen came through the winter and, and laying those first eggs and, and how big a burrow and things like that. But um, I think 100, 100 individuals is a pretty pretty good colony for bumblebees. I don't think they have the uh, uh, size of the colony size like the, the smaller bees, like a honeybee and things like that. Another question for you, Greg. Um, is it how important is it to manage invasive plants like garlic mustard and buckthorn uh, for keeping these spring ephemerals abundant? And um, I think the second question here is asking potentially if there's cost share for managing these invasive species. You did mention some cost share opportunities, um, yep. but they were maybe different than that. Yeah, that's a great question because you know, uh, a lot of these invasives, they green up early, um, you know, so they're competing if they go a monoculture like garlic mustard. So it's very important uh, to make sure those are kept back and at bay uh, to try to control them and have diversity again. You know, Billy talked about diversity. Uh, that's very important uh, for rusty patch bumblebee, for all our bumblebees and pollinators too. But cost share wise, yeah, there's definitely a lot of opportunities. Uh, Equip, the environmental quality incentive programs, been around a long time, but that uh, uh, is cost share for maybe goats even, you know, a lot of different tools we have in our toolbox there. So uh, yeah, definitely a lot of cost share. Check in your local NRCS office and, and they can help you out there. We have a lot of uh, DNR, uh, CDI and PF, Peasants Forever staff in those offices now that can help you do those types of things. So yeah, a lot of opportunity. And we will have a link in the resource packet to help you locate your USDA office and get in touch with those contacts. So that's perfect. Um, we had a question come in for Billy about what type of technical assistance is available for people who have had uh, these, this wind damage on their sites. Yeah, good question. Uh, just like Greg said, um, your first stop should be the, the County USDA Service Center. They're the real experts and they got their finger on the pulse because these things change a lot. But, um, one really timely program that I really uh, recommend you go inquire on, uh, especially in the counties in the middle part of the state that were hardest hit by the August 10th the ratio is the Emergency Forest Restoration Program, EFRP. That program has been around the country. Uh, it's really never been used in Iowa. So the county offices, it's administered by the Farm Service Agency. Uh, so the same folks that administer um, or deal with CRP and Conservation Reserve. But um, every county has kind of got a different status right now that I've been talking to around central Iowa. So they are all recommending stop in, or I guess now call them. Um, <laughs> photos help, uh, and like we talked about before, assessment helps, you know, what's the damage, the extent, uh, photos as safely as you can, and just kind of let them know that you've suffered damage. Um, they'll connect you with a district forester or a forestry professional if you have not got one already. Um, and then that'll do another thing too, is that'll kind of express your need or express the need of folks in the county to get that program uh, active in the county. So what a lot of folks are doing right now, like Story County just applied for it to bring that federal program here into the county. And they've been, go the, uh, the FSA County Director has been going out with landowners to visit a, a storm damage sites um, for that. So in a nutshell, if you do have extensive damage from the day ratio, uh, check out uh, or visit with your county service center and just let them know that you suffered damage and ask about the uh, emergency forest restoration program. And we'll have a link to that fact sheet about what the program is uh, in our resource sheet. And that's just a lot of action for recovery, a lot of financial resources for recovery. Anything from debris removal and site prep to damage to tree shelters and forest roads. So um, anything that can uh, help you get back on your feet and moving forward with your, your management plan. So. And then we've got our standard go-tos, like Greg mentioned, EQIP, and then REAP, Iowa REAP to resource enhancement and protection. Those are all available for tree planting and, and other miscellaneous um, forest management activities. So. Billy, I'm also getting more questions about, um, you know, specific situations that people are seeing on their land. So 
trees that are bent over but still alive and do we bring in logging companies and what do we do in these specific situations? Um, I know you've mentioned getting help. I'm wondering if that's maybe where the, some of these people need to, to need to start. Right. I mean, it all kind of starts with your plan. What's your objective? That's going to determine what you do uh, moving forward. And then again, assessing the damage to the trees. I'm going to, I'm going to pass this off to Pat if he's still here, because one option is a salvage harvest. Uh, if that meets your management goals and if that's going to, uh, what's going to, you know, achieve the, the desired species you want on your land. But those are tricky. And maybe Pat can chime in on, on performing a salvage harvest and what goes into that. Yeah, tip, uh, not always ideal um, to not be able to have a price on your trees before they're cut, but it's really difficult to get an estimate, especially like on a derecho, substantial damage like that, to get an accurate price because there's so much fiber damage in the material. So typically what we do, we'll reach out to the landowner, we'll talk to the landowner and get a plan that they're comfortable with as far as a grade and yield. And basically what that would be is we would try to salvage every piece of material that will no longer grow into a better tree, pull it out to a landing, scale it in our yard, uh, put a price on it, and then try to salvage as much of the material as we can. Um, but like I said, it it's, it's just depends on what you're comfortable with as a landowner. It's, it's really difficult for us, and I would imagine most of us, to put a price on something that's so tangled and broken. You really don't know until you get into the, to get into, to start pulling the material, how badly it's damaged. And what you're able to get, too. Thanks, Pat. Um, I think this, we have time for one more question, and I think I will direct it to Miranda, although we can bounce it around as much as we need to. Um, we have a landowner who is in his 70s and he's trying to plant or he wants to manage his woodland so that uh, his grandchildren can inherit it. Um, so how do they, how should he plan for 80 to 100 years in the future um, to try to help ensure that there's something left for his grandsons? That's a great question. And I, the best part about it is that you're thinking long term, because that's really where we want to be with forest management anyway. It may seem like an exceedingly long view, but it's, but it's not, right? Because trees live a lot longer than we do. Um, so Billy has touched on this a little bit already. I, I think that you know, we, we hear folks talk about the importance of diversity quite a bit but um, it really is key to, to managing our forests effectively because we, we don't have a very a clear view of, of what is going to, to come down the line. Um, I, so I, I do emphasize having that in mind and really working with a forester to develop a plan. And they will, they will ask questions that will help you to think about some of your objectives more clearly and really break them down um, and then provide different options for how you might achieve them. So I, I think it ultimately, it, it, there are many different desired future conditions that you might want for that forest and, and a forester will help you um, figure that out and define them a little bit more clearly. Great, thank you, Miranda. Uh, that is all the time that we have for questions. I think we've gotten to most of them, uh, but we can also follow up with you over email. And I think some of these additional questions will also be answered with the resource packet as well. So um, be sure to look out for that. Um, with that, I wanna thank everyone for being here and I'll hand it off to Billy for a final wrap up. All right. Well, thank you, Julia. And thank you all for attending. Um, we're really excited to do this, this virtual thing this year. So I hope you enjoyed it and uh, pass along to your friends because we're gonna archive it. Again, check the resource sheet to see where we're archiving these, these field days. Uh, but big thanks to our presenters today, and big thanks to our host, Julia. There's a lot that goes on behind the scenes for these, and uh, we really appreciate her hard work. Uh, and thanks to the Iowa Learning Farms for the videography and the editing uh, of these videos. So big, big, big thank you to them. Um, again, keep your eyes open for the, uh, an email that will come very soon. It's going to have the resource packet in there. Uh, a lot of supplemental information about today's talks. We're gonna have a, uh, an evaluation in that email too. That data is really critical to us, uh, just to see if our message is being heard and what impact we're kind of having on the ground. Um, so it is so important that we're encouraging responses 
So every response we get for our fall forestry series, so every evaluation that you return, uh, you will get entered into a drawing for one of three prizes, a chainsaw, chainsaw chaps, or a helmet. So that data is very important. So we're really encouraging uh, responses to those, to the, those evaluations. Um, next, we have another one coming up October 29th. That is with the Iowa Learning Farms. Uh, again, that will be in the resource packet on how to, how to log into that. We're basically taking a tour of Iowa's forests, uh, the many diverse forest types that are out there and sharing uh, the value of those, some interesting facts about them, and management strategies to help perpetuate them on, on the landscape. So again, uh, thank you to everybody for attending and, and spending a part of your day with us today. And get out to your state forests, Yellow River, Shimmick, Stevens, Lust Hills, because they're a really great resource that, that we have here in the state. So thank you and have a good day.